2011, I was fortunate enough to have a lovely friendship with a couple of Chicago-based women lawyers who were highly placed, um, held important positions in the Illinois Bar Association, had been litigation lawyers for many, many years. And our, the topic of our conversation was the female experience of American law. And it threw me into some very deep waters indeed. So we created together a, a program called The Feminine Face of Justice. I want to share some of the findings from the research I did for that program. I began with the image that almost everyone is familiar with because it is celebrated in statuary all over the world, which is the great image of Lady Justice holding the scales of justice in one hand, a sword in the other, blindfolded. Right? This is certainly an image that everyone is familiar with. And I assumed that it went back into deep mythology. But I was hard pressed, in fact, to find a sculpture of blind justice among the antiquities. And this caused me to start searching for blind justice. And what I discovered was astounding to me and critically important. The image of blind justice comes from a book published in 1494 that was a satire. It was a spoof, a parody called The Ship of Fools. And it was, in fact, the very first time that this young artist named Albrecht Dürer had been commissioned to make some woodcuts. And one of his images is Lady Justice, who has been abducted, kidnapped, and is tied up on a ship with a blindfold over her eyes. This was a parody of justice. Now, what we have done with this image is to take what was supposed to be a parody. I mean, who wants blind justice? But instead, the image was so seized upon that people began to make up a new narrative of why blind justice is what we desire. So now the story we tell about it is that justice is blind to class or caste. But initially, it was poking fun. It was saying, you have no idea what you're doing. You don't have any knowledge of justice. You take your client's money to pad your own bank account and wear fancy clothes. This was the in original intention of the parody and of that image. Justice has been hijacked. Let's go back and ask what were some of the originating ideas about the nature of justice and how it manifests itself in human society. Because this is what's really important. Justice is personified as a goddess in the ancient traditions. Sumerian, Egyptian, Greek, Roman. Um, and, and we have beautiful images that show these goddesses of justice. But what's important is that these justices, these goddesses represented a form of justice which was deeply embedded in the natural, organic order of the universe. Okay? as distinct from laws or rules or customs, traditions created by men and societies. All right, we have to make that distinction mm -hmm. and a lot rides on this distinction. So Lady Justice was 
the justice of natural law. Yes, it was a divine justice. In other words, a justice that is primal, that originates with the uprising of the universe itself. So that human laws may come and go. They are subject to change, given the context and the times. But beneath or behind those human laws, there is a greater primal law, which goes hand in hand with the universe itself. Most people will have some knowledge of the Tao, or Taoism. That beautiful symbol of yin-yang, the Tao is one of the best expressions of this primal justice, or even better, primal order. There is a primal order to the way things are, and you go against it at your peril. So the idea, for instance, that if you do something wrong, there will be a retribution that comes to you even if no other human notices it that by acting in a way that you know to be wrong, damaging, harmful, painful to another creature, you have set in motion a kind of primal karmic law. And you can expect to have that or something akin to it visited upon you at some point. This is the essence of what's understood by that level of justice. So the feminine face of justice stands behind human or social law, and is that deep sense of karmic law. Most of the world's traditions have a form of the golden rule, which could be said to be resting, floating upon that ocean of feminine justice, that as you do to another, so shall be done to you. And we create these human laws around that idea mm -hmm. because we sense that there is something primally true about that. So now why is it feminine justice? Why is justice seen yes. as a feminine? Well, this was my question. Why would this be seen as a feminine principle? And the more I read and you know, read into the mythologies and the theologies of these different cultures, the more I began to see that what human beings intuited was that the deep primal justice has one and only one object in the end. What is the goal, the purpose towards which this primal justice moves? Life. The continuation of life in all its forms is the single driving force of the primal principle of justice. So this is why the deep feminine and justice are aligned in this way. Because the feminine is, is that which brings forth life. And why the gods and the heroes must come forth to defend the principles of justice as they are manifest in human law. And it also is important now to recognize that if we, as individual human beings, have aligned ourselves strongly with either the masculine or the feminine principle, by virtue of being born into a male body or a female body, or by predilection, persuasion, choice, what have you, that we also tend to see fairness and justice as arbitrated by these masculine or feminine tendencies. And let me explain what I mean by that. That in the eyes of feminist or feminine justice, the idea is the promotion of life, of harmony, of a restoration of order, in order that all may continue to be part of life. It's a collaborative, cooperative, restorative move, mm. because that's the goal, that all life moves forward. The masculine version of justice plays more on the, the manifest level of human law, where rules, immediately ignite this notion of game, of play. Because when there are laws, it means that there are ways to interpret laws, there are ways to conform or circumvent right. rules and laws. And isn't the masculine known to be about, about freedom, about breaking free of com constraints? Right, and, and <clears throat> the whole masculine trickster energy which wants to figure out the rules in order to break them right. or confound them. 
And this is not a negative tendency. This is simply a different energy or archetype in response to law and the conformity to law. I think of Timothy Ferris as a great example of someone who had the trickster energy and tried to manipulate the rules to win a Chinese kickboxing champion by dehydrating himself in order to weigh in a lower weight class <laughs> and, then, and then being 20 pounds heavier than the, the <laughs> opponent. Even though he couldn't kickbox worth a darn next to that guy, he could shove him out of the ring three times and get him disqualified. But the, the more positive version of Timothy Ferris is that he tries to show Americans how to, how to game their way out of the nine to five, how to game their way okay. out of a capitalist enslavement system. And in that regards, mm -hmm. he's been considered a hero by many. Right. So you can see that that is a double-edged sword. To game the system of law and rule can either be a liberating exercise, but it ultimately defeats the interior or the heart, the spirit of the law. By focusing on the letter of the law and figuring out clever ways to manipulate or manage it, one can, in fact, um, disappoint the spirit of the law. Or create injustice. And create injustice. Out of justice. Right. Well, and to come back to my work with the women lawyers, this was their primary complaint about trying to be women lawyers in this masculine dominated mm -hmm. field. It's because male lawyers perceive law as a form of games. The only purpose is to win. The idea of there being justice is laughed at. You're an ideal You're dreamer. considered a newbie, a naive, innocent, who's just waiting to be squashed oh. underfoot by the first clever lawyer to get in there and break your case. It's like Mr. Smith goes to Washington in the political realm. Yes, Mr. Smith goes in with his high ideals and the notion that what Congress is really supposed to be doing is providing a better system for the people to flourish and discovers that, you know, there's a, a bug under every rock. <laughs> so, so here we have these, these two competing principles, as it were. The system of human law as a game to be won versus the feminist yearning to see justice done as a matter of fairness to promote life at its basis. And these, you can see, are going to be in very deep conflict with each other. When what I'm thinking talking about, about the hashtag here. Me Too movement, hashtag and all Me of the, Too. the power abuse by men, mm -hmm. the sexual misconduct, mm -hmm. um, and just you mm -hmm. know centuries and millennia really of male dominance is really what we're mm -hmm. talking about. Of course, you will find in mythology story upon story of the abuse of females, whether goddesses or mortal women, by the gods having their will with them. But you also find uh, the female goddesses taking revenge on other gods and goddesses or mortals by sending them off to be raped by somebody as penalty for some infringement. So there seems to be equal amounts of uh, vengeful activity going on <laughs> cross-sexually in the mythologies. But there are a couple of key figures that I think we need to look at, and I'm going to stick for the most part with Greek mythology because we are so familiar with it. In Greek mythology, Zeus is the king of the gods and wields the most power. His first wife is a goddess that we almost never hear of because at the very beginning of the story, she is swallowed up and lives on inside of Zeus. Her name is Metis, M-E-T-I-S, Metis. And she is swallowed because it is foretold that the child she gives birth to could be more powerful than Zeus himself. So he becomes very anxious around this. He took over from his father. So he's very familiar with that, mm -hmm. looks like. Right? <laughs> so he swallows Metis, and what happens is that she gives birth to a daughter, but the daughter is twice born. She is then born again from the head of her father. This is Athena. And when she is the twice born from the head of Zeus, she becomes his greatest champion. She is now, you know, instead of the birth canal where she's picking up the attributes of the feminine, she's coming through the mental realm, picking up the attributes of the masculine. So Athena, the goddess of wisdom and warcraft, is 
one of the great avenging goddesses of Greek mythology and carries with her the attributes of the patriarchy. Now what's very interesting, and, I, and a lot of our viewers may have read or at least heard of the best-selling book, Goddesses in Every Woman by Jean Shinoda Bowen. This was a very important book in the women's liberation movement, along with Clarissa Pinkoli Estes, Women Who Run With the Wolves. These are several of the books that really captured the attention of American women. But Jean Shinoda Bolin is a Jungian analyst and was able to take each of the important Greek goddesses and sort of unpack their archetypal energies and show how those archetypes of personality are active in the world today. And she did a brilliant job of analyzing the Athena type woman. So this is daddy's daughter. This is the woman whose focus is on career, who has a lot of ambition and drive to be with the men in the wide world. She excels in office politics. Uh, she doesn't take any guff. She really knows how to hold her own in conversation. She has that capacity to read men as if they were all her brothers because she is so much a part of the patriarchy and one of its staunch defenders. But for every you know, positive attribute given to the Athena type woman, there of course is a shadow. The shadow is the pieces of a whole personality which have been relegated to the unconscious because they would conflict with or disempower the attributes that you've decided to move forward with. Think yin yang. If you're going to be extroverted, it means you can't be introverted. If you're going to be ambitious, it means you, that you can't be retiring. So if we look at the shadow of the Athena archetype, what we find is a woman who has spent very little time working in the realm of her emotions, of the deep, soft, receptive, feminine emotions. Because those would be a dangerous thing to take into a masculine dominated workplace. But the fact that they are being sent back into the unconscious means that they are immature. They haven't sort of moved and developed along with the woman herself. So they're latent, they're there, but she hasn't actually brought them forth. And what happens with these kinds of emotional energies is that they develop in this woman who has brought forth herself as a helmeted, fierce, armored warrior in the workplace. The opposite of that is this very tender-hearted, thin-skinned, fragile-feeling, emotionally hypersensitive human being. Do you see where I'm going with yeah. this? And <clears throat> what, these are not bad qualities. This is just what happens if you overemphasize one part of an archetypal energy package, wow. the other parts will be de-emphasized and therefore have not been able to emerge and develop. So you're suggesting that with the more Athena archetypal energy pervading in Western society today, where women are taking on more masculine patriarchal mm -hmm. traits in order to fit into the power structure, that they are at the same time bringing in the shadow of the victim. And it's necessary. This is an energetic necessity, right? That having a strong Athena archetype in your dominant personality structure means that you have psychologically constellated its correlative shadow. Those may be some big words, but that is the best way to describe it. There is a psychological principle going on here and you cannot deny it. If you do deny it, then you run into the danger of misunderstanding what's going on. It no longer is tolerable to try to do ethics and justice without taking psychology into account. We know too much psychology to be ignorant of it. We cannot afford that anymore. So if we take what the psychologists have been exploring for over a hundred years and try to integrate that into our understanding of fairness and justice, 
we run up against this problem of the dark feminine shadow, which brings us to another goddess whose name will be familiar to everyone, but whose actual activity and background is probably a mystery. Her name is Nemesis. Nemesis is an important goddess. She is sort of the, the counterpoint to Themis, who is the Greek goddess of justice. Themis, in fact, is Zeus's second wife. Right after he swallowed Metis, he was lonely, and so he got a second wife named Themis, who is the original counselor, the original protector and guardian of this primal justice and wisdom. And so she remains in Zeus's uh, Olympic court and is his wise counselor. And apparently she and Hera, the third wife, get along very well. So Themis is important for bringing this kind of knowledge of primal justice into the courts of the gods and mortals and reminding them what's really at stake. But if she is not listened to, if she is not heeded, there is another dark goddess keeping records. It's interesting that in almost all the stories about Nemesis, she's pictured sitting on a rock taking notes, mm. right? I'm watching you. <laughs> she knows when you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. No. She's the record keeper of all of the flagrant abuses and misuses. And then she comes with a very sharp sword and slays those who have been improper. She's especially keen on those who lift themselves up as so proud and mighty that they don't have to subscribe to the deep primal laws of justice. Wow. People like that particularly piss her off. <laughs> you <laughs> she's think got, you're above the law. She's huh? got another weapon, which is even nastier, which is one of those horrible pointed bladed balls on a long iron staff that you swing around and you bash people. Yeah. Wow. So Nemesis is a fearful goddess, and there were plenty of temples built to try to appease her because you don't want her coming around. And yet, it was felt that she was absolutely essential. Because in order for human society to move forward smoothly, you have to have a certain amount of humility and a recognition that fate is visited upon all of us, that all of us rise and fall, that all of us make advances and then are thrown down into defeats. And that this breeds a kind of humility and compassion, which is the very foundation of human society, without which you have huge disparities, which unbalance the whole cart and lead to disaster. One of the other things that she dislikes more than anything is someone upon whom fortune has smiled and has decided that they were somehow entitled to it and go around bragging about how wealthy or how successful or how many battles they've won. Oh, she can hardly wait to get her hands on these. <laughs> I wonder what Nemesis wants to do to Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to be political there for a second, but he is entitled about his success. Well, let's be frank. All of us dislike people who go around pretending that they're vast, wealth or power is due to how clever they are. Yeah. Because at some deep, deep level, we know it's that's not true. not true. It's highly circumstantial. Yes. Malcolm Gladwell Matters. wrote a wonderful book, I think it was called Outliers, mm -hmm. where he describes how, how the most successful people of our time were in the right place at the right time. That their birth year was perhaps the singularly mm -hmm. most important mm -hmm. factor in their financial success. Mm -hmm. Obviously, part of you was a factor in that. You can't become a billionaire mm -hmm. while being an idiot by not making some good, some good moves, but you've got to also credit the, the circumstances. Right, and fate is also a feminine character mm -hmm. in mythology, right? right? In Greek mythology, we have three fates. This kind of worldview breeds a people who have that sense of humility who are willing to acknowledge that, okay, you are up on the wheel of fate, 
but the wheel of fate continues to move and it may in fact drag you down. In some of the uh, later images of Nemesis, we see her traveling, riding on a wheel that is, is turned mm -hmm. like this. And she uses this wheel as a discus to fling at people who have prided themselves too much on being on top of the wheel of fate. She's to spin them around, <laughs> knock them down. She's kind of sadistic. <laughs> yes, well, let's look at that, right? If you have tried as Themis to bring people to heal, to have them humble enough to acknowledge that power must be distributed evenly and that we all have our moments of rising and falling and... To make amends for the wounds that we've caused on other right. people. If people have been unwilling to listen to the more gentle, circumspect Themis, what can you do but call in Nemesis? She is the goddess of last resort, but she is necessary because otherwise you have such a grotesque imbalance that you have a lack of fairness in society and a deep insult to primal justice herself. So the nemesis must come in. At the individual level, though, if you have not been taking care to bring your own themis energy up into consciousness, right, to say, I'm willing to be attuned to my deep intuition about what's right and wrong, about what power ought to be and how it ought to be shared, and when someone has encroached upon my sense of dignity or honor and when I should push back. Right, all of these things that are still in the realm of uh, good civic intercourse. These, this is Themis. Themis, by the way, is the goddess who convenes the circles, who convenes feasts, who sits at the head of all tables of uh, judgment and conversation and dialogue. If you have not activated Themis energy, but you only have your Athena warrior out there with her less than developed emotions, then what may be activated is nemesis. Because Within you only you, have as access person. as a human being, as an individual. You don't have these models of a mature, powerful goddess energy that sets justice amongst the, you know, right there at the center of the table and demands that people acknowledge it. So nemesis becomes activated in the collective unconscious. And it feels like that's where we are, that Themis and her claims have been ignored for so long. And there is now so much Athena energy among women, out of necessity, right? When women moved into the workplace, they quickly realized that you can't be too much of a Demeter, a mama, and you certainly can't bring too much Aphrodite. So, you know, what's left? Or Artemis and Athena are useful archetypes to bring into the workplace. But you now have the constellation of the dark goddess and her vicious attacks on the perceived injustices that have been done to women, which are actual, but have been heightened in their monstrosity by the unripened female emotional self. Certain things done to a mature 35-year-old goddess-empowered woman would have very little effect. They would roll off her like water off the back of a duck. When done to an 11-year-old, young, naive, innocent female, these are truly horrendous things. So the developmental state of the emotional self is a critical piece in what we are seeing right now. Right. When you're a little child, you, don't, you haven't developed your armor. No. You don't know when to, when to seal up. And so if you get wounded young, then mm -hmm. your armor starts automatically sealing up at different times. You can understand that if you've adopted the Athena stance in the outer world as a woman, you've always got your helmet and armor on. So the courage to remove your helmet and actually look at the wounds that have been dealt you, to remove your armor, 
and look at the wounds to your female body that have been done by this society, it's horrific, right? Because under that armor is the body of the 12 year old, of the innocent virgin. And so this is a, a really dreadful time because a lot of the Athena women are finally developing the courage to say, okay, this isn't all of me. I want the other side of my human personality. As the women lawyers in Chicago were demanding, I'm tired of putting goddamn armor and helmet on every time I walk into a courtroom. I want to bring my Demeter. I want to bring my soft, powerful feminine to seek real justice for real people in real situations. To do that, you have to take the armor off. And now you see all the damage that's been done to you as an embodiment of the young, beautiful, feminine, and now you have to avenge that in order for the young feminine to heal and begin to grow into maturity. Because what we really need is more of the mature, true feminine, integrated feminine, right, to be able to come into right. the workplace, into politics, into the law, everywhere in society. You know, boys are used to like, you know, hitting each other and, and it's, it's a fun, I mean, they enjoy having, having this battle. It's, it's a test, you know, it sharpens your steel, it makes you feel tough. Well, you're putting your finger on one of the key differences between masculine and feminine psychology, mm -hmm. that men are very ready to see almost everything as a game because that's what they're good at. They're really, really good at playing games. They understand rules, they understand competition and hierarchy. It's very clear. Uh, lines are clearly drawn in games with rules. What women appear to be doing is very messy, very confusing. There's a lot of things that don't seem to have an answer where you clearly can't win. And even to suggest winning and losing irritates the hell out of women. So men are very often terribly uncertain of how to enter into the feminine realm because all of the rules are different. Now, I, I will say that Joseph Campbell, the mythologist, took a very um, feminist view of ancient rituals of coming of age, which was one of his favorite topics. He said, you know, the thing is that if you look at, at uh, the rituals of bringing a boy into manhood, they're all extremely dramatic and dangerous and painful and nasty and ripping the child away from mother and childhood in order to make him a man and beat him up and there must be blood and fear. He said, in point of fact, boys and men have spent most of their lives playing games because women are doing all of the serious important things, right? For a woman, the young woman, he says reality and necessity visit her in the form of her first menstruation. She bleeds and does not die. And then she, like the earth itself, brings forth new life and nurtures it from her own body. He said, do you know how jealous men are? I mean, these are not mortals. This is an immortal kind of activity <laughs> that the women are doing. Women are clearly goddesses. Who the hell are we? Which is why the men have to do all of these great things showing how brave and proud and, and exceptional they are because they don't feel that they are. They feel small and helpless in the face of this grandiosity, which is feminine creation. Right. And psychologically, all of us being nursed by the mother, right. there's an automatic power imbalance for, for young men until they have some ritualistic uh, coming into adulthood position where they separate from the mother's energy and power. Exactly, right? right. So the, whether you're looking at Freud or Jung or Adler, all of these things, there is an agreement here that for the boy to individuate, to develop, he has to reject the feminine in order to identify with the masculine and become out of the reach right. of the all-embracing And so I just have to add here that this is what I see as, as often so destructive. The way our culture has given men the rituals to differentiate and separate from the feminine are misogynistic, are incredibly negative. I had a professor in, in college, Michael Mester, who wrote about the sports theory lens on 
on sociology. He documented all these cases of high school football teams where they were gang raping young women and high-fiving over it. And most of the men, there were only a few leaders that were really behind or instigators of this activity. The rest of the men coalesced because they looked up to these men as leaders in their community. They looked, they felt like this was their mm -hmm. ritual to adulthood. Getting laid is your mm -hmm. rite of passage to adulthood, mm -hmm. which I think personally is sick and ridiculous because getting laid does not take a lot of, a lot of anything. But falling in love for the first time, that is a rite of passage, I will tell you. Mm -hmm. That takes courage. Courage to be seen, courage mm -hmm. to hold another person without hurting them. That's huge. But just having sex, that is not a healthy ritual for men to become men. So our culture has a lot that it has to answer to in terms of what it has provided its young people for their own self-development and maturation. We are not doing a good job of these alternatives. And by keeping the emphasis on the um, masculine qualities. Discouraging emotional and empathic thinking. Discour yes. Discouraging sensitivity. Yes. Which is exactly the thing we need right now. Mm -hmm. Because to actually give women power, to actually not discriminate against women at work, you have to be sensitive enough as a man to recognize if your flirtation or comment or joke is, is really pleasing her, mm -hmm. or if she's smiling with, with a r disgust underneath the surface because you've really just hurt her. That's, that's what is actually needed today. Mm -hmm. it's, and this is an, I may be sounding, you know, like I'm asking too much. Some men may be like, oh, come on. Like, you know, we shouldn't have to be that sensitive. Women should just tell us when, uh, when they're offended. Yes, I think we need a more open culture. But at the same time, there's so many subtle things that go on in human communication that's never going to be enough. And sensitivity has to rise within the masculine mm -hmm. in our culture in order to, to create balance. So to use the archetypal image, every Zeus must welcome his Themis to the table, mm -hmm. the great counselor. He must ask her to sit with him when he goes to the table to administer the realm. Otherwise, nemesis is yes. soon to follow. That's right. That's right. So it does pose this curious problem then of what we might call the chicken and the egg dilemma. Which comes first? The social movement forward, the revolutions that overturn social values and norms or actual laws, or the inner work, human beings as individuals gaining new perceptions and values. Some people say you have to push history forward by demanding new laws or new social norms. And one of the advances that we made in the last 20 years was this idea of political correctness, that you had to watch what you said and did at work. You couldn't hang girly photos up over your desk because you could be reported and you know, challenged or even fired if you were telling smutty jokes at the coffee right. center or over the water cooler. So political correctness really took hold and extended into many realms. You know, teachers have to be very careful how and what they teach. You can't fall into old mistakes about gender, for instance. You can't introduce books that never use the word pronoun she but only use the pronoun he or your course gets yanked from the catalog, right? So in many, many ways, we pushed our culture forward through laws right. that made certain kinds of speech intolerable to the politically sensitive mind. Athena style. Right, which is not necessarily wrong because we do need laws to safeguard the new ideals that are reaching consciousness, at least for the few at the top who have done the necessary work to perceive the new horizon. But of course, what we discovered, and as you pointed out not too long ago, the election of Donald Trump was an incredible eye-opener 
that all of this political correctness had really been just a cork in a bottle of evils. And that the minute that he popped the cork, all of this foul smelling stuff started to pour out and fill up the country. Right. Most Trump supporters had very specific reasons for voting for Trump, but a lot of them did have this reason of shooting down political correctness, which mm -hmm. they feel is an incredibly oppressive thing for them. And that tells me that they don't understand, they don't really understand what they're being told not to do and why. So what is Themis? How do we invoke Themis mm -hmm. to actually get us through this, to actually teach us, teach us the morals that we're not learning through law? Well, the first task is to ask what is really there? Right? We have to be extraordinarily, ruthlessly honest to ask what the state of the nation truly is. And to invoke the great Freudian phrase, I think what we are seeing is a return of the repressed, which is a law of psychology. Whatever is repressed returns in an uglier form. So now we simply have to acknowledge that what we thought had been handled and evolved has not been handled and evolved as a culture. Some of the individuals in the culture may have evolved to truly be feminists and to be not racists, but a vast group of the culture has not evolved. So we just have to be honest and say this is where this we is are where currently. At. You can't legislate our way into more maturity. No. No, you can't legislate, legislate your way out of psychological reality. Right. So if this is the psychological reality, then we need to ask what kinds of experiences do we need to seek as a culture to allow people to also come to a place of honesty right. with themselves and their own reality? So that instead of resisting the reality, you simply accept that that is what's happening. Right. And part of what is happening is that the Wheel of Fortune is rolling and has turned under its grinding stone some of the people who formerly felt themselves pretty much near the top which would be white men. middle but class white, white men. Not all white men, middle class white men. Yeah, middle class white men. And even thought that the wheel was turning in their favor and that they were going to keep moving up more and more to the top to become richer and right. richer. And for a while, it seemed as if maybe economy and society was moving in that direction. Rather suddenly, the wheel of fate has apparently moved in the other direction and is grinding them underfoot. This is such a disturbing place to be, partly because we no longer believe in fate. We now have a pernicious worldview that says it's all meritocracy. This is part of the Protestant work ethic. If you're not rich, it's your own goddamn fault, and God is not pleased with you. Okay, so instead of being able to simply go, oh, it is my bad fortune to be not on the receiving end <laughs> at this time, right? Um, fortune is smiling on someone else. That's the way it goes, all right? And take it with that kind of, oh well. But we're not. We're, but we, we don't have that worldview. We all feel entitled. So if, both, both sides feel entitled is the problem. Right. We both feel wounded mm -hmm. and entitled at the same time. Mm -hmm. the, the right and the left, women mm -hmm. and men, are feeling like, ah, mm -hmm. I'm being abused here. Right. Where's my apology? Right. right. And for women, too. There was the sense that we worked so hard to get the women's liberation movement started. So much sacrifice was made to get women into positions of power in the workplace and politics to change laws, to change the, how things were done in society so that women would feel that their core values were being more honored. Yeah. But instead, what has actually happened is that the core values of the feminine, which again, remember, are in support of life, are nowhere nearer to being realized. We still don't have 
health care. We still don't have um, daycare for children. We still don't have women and children out of poverty. Mm. Old women are still the poorest of the poor in our society. Instead, we have tax cuts for, for the wealthy, for, for the, the wealthy corporations, male corporations, for the games. Yes. We continue to reward games. To reward games, and the winners of games especially. Yeah. So women also feel that the wheel of fate has ground them underfoot after all of their sacrifices. So we have a tremendous amount yes. of pent up rage against the unfairness and the injustice of society. Are we not blaming the wrong thing? I mean, we're not blaming each other for something that is really a systemic problem. Mm -hmm. There are only a few people at the top of the system who are really hugely benefiting from the patriarchy. Mm -hmm. Everyone else is getting screwed over to greater or lesser degrees, yes. right? It destroys women at the mental level, uses you, and mm -hmm. makes your mind insignificant. And for men, it, it makes your body insignificant. We send you to war. Mm -hmm. We brutalize you for the patriarchy. Mm -hmm. So everyone's getting wounded here. And that, I think, is a point that is not appreciated enough, um, especially by the more radical feminists, that patriarchy wounds most ordinary men. That patriarchy is only a good deal for the men at the very, very top of the system. And that everyone else is being ground up as fodder for the machine that benefits the few who have made it to the top. So this is a very deadly game for men and women alike. And if there were a greater appreciation for this economic game um, that is being played and won by a handful, the 1%, very specifically the 1%, I think a lot of the radical feminists would be able to recognize that most men are your true allies, not your enemies, because their acting out, their outrage is also based in a place of wounding and uh, humiliation that is being visited upon them by patriarchy, the same as it is for you. Women are definitely taking the brunt mm -hmm. of the trauma from the patriarchy, but everybody's being wounded. And that's why we get triggered and we, we, we can't apologize. We can't just deal with reality because we've got this deep, internal trigger saying, no, mm -hmm. I've been wronged. I will not apologize. And on top of that, we've got a puritanical sexual shame. Mm -hmm. And while women are right now pointing out men and their flawed, sexual, perverted behavior that hurts women and expecting men to own up to it, I think that they don't always notice that these men aren't just being cagey and dishonest to hold back their truth. They're ashamed of it. And never before have we asked anybody to publicly tell the world about the intimate details of their sexual shameful activities. That is very new. Well, we might also want to ask, under patriarchy, which is the system we've been under, what does the courtship look like? because it's important to recognize that social norms control how we behave towards each other, especially over these critical rites of passage, one of which is finding a suitable mate to pair up with and raise children and create a household, etc. The design of patriarchy follows the social Darwinian idea that the, the fittest should have their pick of the females. So it's constructed within the game of winning, of competitive wins and losses, which means that the onus is on the male to go out aggressively seeking the female and simultaneously show her and the other males why he is the one to be chosen and nobody else. So there's this constant need to you know, one-up the guys next to you for fear that you will not be chosen and you will not be able to partner up and mate, right? right? So the aggression is built into the system without which there would be no courtship, without which there would be no mating. 
This is a really, really difficult problem because we're all hardwired now to understand the subtle and not so subtle cues of the script of the mating game. Mm -hmm. And it all requires that the male act first and be the one to either achieve a yes or be smacked down and rejected. Mm -hmm. So the masculine ego is constantly um, victim to these highs and lows, the cycle of adrenaline-based terror of the risk he's taking to reach out and try to make that courtship start right. and the potential of being rejected and thrown down again into the state of humiliation. Right. The women have been trained to be the passive observers to say yay or nay, but other than that to make no advances. So this is a very uh, dire straits that we're in right now. Because if the men are too frightened to enter into the necessary aggression phase of the courtship dance, and if every aggressive move in the courtship dance is now perceived as being um, an unwanted advance, we've thrown the script out. We've basically said this script won't work, right. but we don't know what to replace it with. Right. Clearly, there are problems with the script, and we're not enjoying the mm -hmm. We're not liking the script very much. And I, I like to go in my imagination and say, well, what would society look like? Could mm -hmm. society be equal? Perhaps the reason men don't understand what it's like to be a woman saying no is that men never say no. That men are trained to be sluts, basically. Mm -hmm. most, to most, always say yes. To always say, like, sex, all right. You know, mm -hmm. most, men, most men are like that. that. Women are so practiced in saying no that they're good at it. Men just maybe don't have sympathy for what a woman is going through because mm -hmm. it, the revolts have never been reversed on him. Mm -hmm. And what would it be like in a society? Is it, is it possible for us to get to a place where we have a parody, pursuer, dynamic, or, or even reverse? Well, That's it would certainly be a struggle for our society because we have so many hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of years of perceiving the masculine as the aggressor. Right. But anthropology has certainly given us beautiful examples of other kinds of strategies. In matriarchal societies, for instance, there's a variety of ways. In one beautiful matriarchal African culture, the men have to come in and dance. They dress themselves up. They put on their most beautiful face paint and headdresses, and they do these dances. And it's hours and hours because they're having to show, you know, how much strength and fortitude they have. Stamina. And the women just sit around watching, right, cheering them on from time to time. But they're just watching, and now they're going to choose. The peacock system. The peacock system. Oh, I like it. In another <laughs> uh, culture, uh, the older women make the choices. They go and they watch the young men interacting and fighting and playing games and as well as doing their, uh, their, their lessons, their recitations of poetry because they're very concerned about getting only warrior types. Uh, they, don't, they don't want that. And so the women, the mothers and the grandmothers, decide which of the men appears to be most balanced and kindest and then they arrange for him to come to the family dwelling to meet their daughters. So in this way, you are very carefully defining the genetic pool of who's going to be selected according to the virtues that the women themselves mm. find to be most appropriate and harmonious for an ongoing civil society. Mm. Wow. So we do have examples of how it could be done differently, but right. it would be very hard, I think. Although. We have some peacock society. Yeah. I think maybe a dance off would. <laughs> I think that sounds a lot healthier than than <laughs> our current system, which slightly resembles kidnapping. <laughs> yes, it does. And maybe the high school prom would be exactly the place to start this new mm. system. The men get to go in the circle and dance, and then the women decide who they're going to. <laughs> the peacocking movement. Peacock. I love it. I love it. I would like to take us back to the healing. Mm -hmm. the themis energy, because I think that restorative justice is a term that we don't hear enough in society today, that themis does exist in our system. Mm -hmm. Athena uh, may have taken over for Lady Justice mm -hmm. in, in our society, 
The legal system creates very sharp and exacting mm -hmm. penalties for crime, but doesn't necessarily heal mm -hmm. what was taken mm -hmm. from society. And I think it cuts both ways. I think that a lot of women in the current climate are going to be very disappointed at what the law is capable of rendering to them because they've been so deeply wounded. Mm -hmm. And the law is either going to give some, you know, some sentence to this man that's very intense and maybe she, maybe she feels like, oh, well, he got what he deserved, or it's going to give some justice that's not good enough and she's going to feel like the law betrayed her. Mm -hmm. And in reality, even if she gets the maximum justice, maximum penalty against this man, it's not going to heal her. We know that. It doesn't fix the wounding. It doesn't fix the trauma. Mm -hmm. But restorative justice is, is a much more themis-oriented system of justice, is it not? It certainly is. And once again, we're looking at the difference between the social law and the primal justice. Because the social law is what you can engage like a, a champion with a huge bludgeoning sword um, to go and seek vengeance, wreak havoc on your enemy. And there might be a, a moment of satisfaction when that judgment is made at that level. But what you're saying is there is a, a deeper place, which is the realm of the feminine emotional stance towards the sense of wholeness, the sense of being in harmony with the deep laws of life. And that cannot be touched by the human laws of society, which deals only with, um, you know, tilting the scales of justice to try to balance or unbalance, but it is simply not capable of that deep healing, which we call restoration to wholeness. But you'd have to be willing to move out of the mental system of retributive so-called law and go down into the deeper place of seeking a primal justice, which says wholeness requires that everyone in the story be given a place at the table. And for some people, that is simply too horrible for them to contemplate right now. They don't want certain people at the table. They don't want to hear those voices. And as long as that feeling that we can't even suffer you to be heard at the table goes on, you can't get to the restorative justice because restorative justice literally begins in a circle with everybody facing each other. If you, can, if you can't sit that way, then you can't seek restorative justice. Right. The, the very principle of it says we are all entitled to seek what life has to offer us. And moving into that space is a huge shift because it, it means you are relinquishing one of the archetypes. You are bidding Nemesis be gone. I will, I will not use your broadsword for this battle. In fact, I'm giving up the idea of this being a battle with a winner and a loser and a victim and a perpetrator. Instead, I'm allowing myself to move into a space where we just accept that life has this kind of turning wheel of fortune and that many things happen and that every cause has many reactions, some of which are going to be painful to us and to others. And that as a group of simple, humble human beings, we're going to try to come together and feel each other's pain and arrive at a new narrative which allows all of us to somehow coexist in more or less harmony. But really, we have to let go of this superficial notion of justice being done by the law. Because if you don't, you will always have that nagging feeling of, yeah, I could have gotten a better deal. You know, I really wanted to see yeah. him suffer. And so this right. requires a shift of consciousness that is very hard for some people to achieve. I think that we really need to consider it 
everyone should consider it because of the long-term damage that we're doing. The punitive justice system doesn't create healing on these issues. It basically buries them. Every time another man just goes to jail and doesn't get, doesn't really understand what he did to that woman, and the rest of society just goes, oh, there's another bad apple thrown away in, in, in jail, mm -hmm. we don't take collective responsibility for what's going on in the culture. We don't recognize this is systemic. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is not going away. It's being continually passed down from generation to generation mm -hmm. because we're not properly learning the lessons of the pain that's already affected the mm -hmm. people in our society. And there's something beautiful, too, about when your story is heard. When you're no longer having to fight to defend your reality because someone's saying, no, I didn't do that, he, she's lying, she's, she's making it up. When, when that person can say, you're right, I did that. I, I'm so, I hurt you and I'm so, so sorry, I'm ashamed of it. I did it out of weakness or I did it out of spite or whatever. I, it, I was an asshole. It was a horrible thing. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I want to try to make amends. I don't know how I can make amends to you, but I want to. I mean, to, to, to hear that, instead of just he hired his lawyers and fought uh, mm -hmm. tooth and nail to survive, those stories could be spread into our culture. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful thing about trauma, as horrible as it is, is that when, when you finally have gotten a grasp of it and you've healed it, you become like one of these deeper roots into the system of compassion that can reach the water during a drought. And you bring society together when they're flailing apart. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think you do have reason to hope. We have extraordinary stories from the South African Truth and Reconciliation. After apartheid. Yes. And to read or to watch the documentary on that, it shows what can be done when a system is put in place to champion this telling of the story and receiving of the story and the healing of the hurts on both sides. So we do have those stories. We also have growing evidence that humans are not hardwired to be tooth and nail competitive and to seek only their own good, right? The social Darwinian idea has been shown over and over again to be um, an incorrect interpretation of what Darwin was trying to say. This is not, in fact, how human beings behave. One of our current great social political theorists and philosophers, Martha Nussbaum, has a book called Compassion, the Basic Social Emotion, and has wonderful evidence that shows again and again that all human societies, in fact, can be traced back to the emotion of compassion. Because without compassion, no one would grow to adulthood, number one. I mean, at the most simple, basic level. We'd all be basically sociopaths. Be, yes, because it requires so much compassion to bring a child up, to put aside <laughs> one's own selfish needs and desires in order to care for the young is an act of compassion in and of itself. And compassion begets compassion. Be compassion begets compassion. The feminine understanding and recognition of what makes human beings human is so profound and fundamental that we should be dazzled and confused that men have been able to pull the wool over everyone's eyes and pretend that the competitive game is the natural way of being a human being. It isn't. Below the love of the game, of the finite game of winning and losing is the infinite game of loving and begetting. And that is the much more important game to be understanding right now. The game of competition and winning and losing is standing in the way of the joyful game of loving and begetting. And 
we are at a crossroads where we right. do need to remind people that whatever happens at this superficial realm of legalese and vengeance, we all are in fact floating on the great ocean of Rida, which is the Hindu word for primal justice, the primal order of how things are. And how things are is embedded in the deep heart of humanity, which begins and ends in compassion.